just so that I can make sure we cover the full ground. The title of today's message is Keeping Your Witness Before Evil Men. God has put you there for that purpose. God has put you where you are in front of evil men for the purpose of keeping your witness. And every one of us have that responsibility. Cannot avoid it. Sometimes the person you date is the evil one. And you got to be a witness and a light to them. The Bible even goes on to, to talk about how, how the wife is sanctified. If the husband is saved and the wife is not saved, and she's pleased to dwell with him. Don't put that woman away. That might be your couple. God is in the business of strategically putting light before darkness. Sometimes we complain, all these people are wicked in this job. Oh, you the light. You the answer. This whole school is going to hell. You the answer. That's why I got you there. You're supposed to be the one encouraging. You're the one supposed to be the one showing love. You're the one who's supposed to be the one, I'm not going to take that, that joint. You're supposed to be the one, I'm not going to get into that mess. Yes, the girl may be not dressed the best, buy her something rather than talking about it. You hearing what I'm saying? Use your money to be a blessing to her. You see she don't have, be a blessing to her. Light in the midst of darkness. You are the answer. And I'm going to read this little statement the Lord has given me, and then I'll start reading a few scriptures. The Bible says, well, not the Bible, but this is the statement that God has given me. He said, Thus said, Lord, I've commissioned you to stand in the earth and to be witness of me. I've called you to speak, be examples, call to repentance, call people to repentance, be lights in darkness. To give me glory with your lips in every place of the world. Can we give God the glory? Can we give him the glory? In a staff meeting, in a meeting room, when we're on the phone with our friends, can we give him the glory? That's what he put us there for. Even in your homes, on your jobs, among your family members, believe me, I have sent you there for this purpose. Glorify me before men that I might be glorified in you. In other words, if you allow Jesus to be glorified, it's going to have a dual effect. Those people will see Jesus, and Jesus will be magnified in you. And we, have, we have to make the choice to do that. You have to make the choice that Jesus is going to be magnified in me so that he can also be magnified or seen by them. Again, you're the answer. God has strategically dealt with the darkness in this earth. And you know what he did? He put you as a candle there. And we can't run from places because we don't like it because it's dark. Sometimes you were put there for that reason. Now, I mentioned relationships, so I'm going to go ahead and read my verse in 1 Corinthians 7. And the Bible says, to the unmarried command, I command, yet not I, but the Lord. In other words, now Paul is saying, I'm about to give you a commandment, but I didn't just give you this commandment, God gave you this commandment. And what was this commandment? Let not the wife depart from her husband, but if she depart, let, the, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband. God is not about divorce. 
It happens all the time. The Bible says it does because of the hardness of people's hearts. So it happens. But God says that, okay, if you're going to be a Christian about this thing, if both of you are going to be Christians and you just have to separate, remain unmarried. Remain unmarried. And if you decide you're ready to have a relationship again, go back to that person that you left. That's the Christian way to handle it. That's the Christian way to handle it. It says, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. Now, Paul is about to say something else. And he says, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Now, one of the things you got to understand about Paul here is, even though he's saying, you're not going to find this in the law of Moses. <laughs> because when Jesus was teaching about divorce, he went back to the example of Genesis. And I want you leave their home. Cleave to the wife. Husband cling to the wife. And the two will become one flesh. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. He went back to the example of Genesis when he said that. When he was teaching on divorce. But Paul goes on to teach more. In other words, God is about to give some new instruction through him. Later on in that same chapter, you'll read where Paul actually says that his judgment was inspired by the Spirit of God. It says in 1 Corinthians 7 40, this is the exact same chapter. When he gets ready, when he says, when he says, I'm about to tell you something and not the Lord. But later on in the same chapter, he says, but she is happy if she so abide after my judgment, and I think I also, I think also that I have the Spirit of God. That's 1 Corinthians 7 and 40. And so what he's saying here is, is I'm about to give you some new instruction about relationships. Now, you're not going to find this in the law of Moses, but I think I have the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to my judgment. So God is about to impart some new information, in other words, about how to handle relationships and callings. And so when you go back there, it says, and you continue, it says, but to the rest speak I and not the Lord. If any brother have a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. So you have a wife, she doesn't believe. But this unbeliever, for whatever reason, want to hang with your Christian self. He says, if that be the case, don't, don't put her away. And the woman which hath the husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. There are a lot of people leaving people because they're just looking at us and just the filthiest sin I've ever seen. Cursing, you smoke, you, you, there's no limits on where you, where you go, what you listen to. And the Bible is saying here, Paul is just speaking about the Spirit, is saying that if that unbelieving person want to dwell with you, I'll put them away. And he goes on to say the reasoning behind it. This is God reasoning behind that. Verse 27, 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. In other words, God has put you there in the midst of that dark famine to clean it up. God is trying to bring holiness to a dark family. 
So you have an, an instance here where the wife is saved, the husband is not in the Lord, the children are not in the Lord. God says, I'm going to stick some light in the midst of that darkness because I want to save the house. I want to clean this house up. I want to show and reveal Christ in that house. God is trying to save the family unit. And again, like I said earlier, sometimes we try to check out of that darkness because we're tired of it. Sometimes it's a little abusive with its words and how it speaks. Did Jesus suffer? Did he have to hear some harsh words? Did he shed blood striving against sin? Yes. They put a crown of thorns on his head and mocked him. But we check out because they call us fat all the time. Or call us stupid. Now, I ain't telling you to take that. You need to correct that. You don't call me stupid. I'm not stupid. I'm not telling you to be somebody's doormat. But there's a respectful way to say you need to respect me. And then commit the whole thing into the hands of the Lord. Because again, God is in the business of trying to save that one with that abusive mouth. And God is also in the business of trying to save those children yes. that don't fear the Lord, that don't pray, that act like they're not hearing you. And you call a Bible study in your living room and they... <sighs> it's killing them to hear some scriptures. They don't realize something is wrong with them when they feel like You are broken on the inside of you if you feel like that. Jesus said, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. People who speak against manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You've got to be careful when parents get a fire in them and revelation, and they want to impart that into the house. How do you think about that whole scenario? Talk to kids now, when your parents call you to live in the Bible study. And you know why that's good? Because we need to train our families to seek God more than just on Sunday. Yes. Yes. That we need to seek Him on our own. And that it's okay to seek God at home. Even though you been to prayer on Thursday, and even though you came to church on Sunday. The house needs to be serving God. It's like Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And God has seen a bunch of homes full of darkness, and he has stuck a light in there. And the light got to be careful. Unless the Lord release you, because there is a place in here for separation. Unless the Lord release you, not to check out. Because you're serving a purpose. You're on a divine mission to keep your own blood, in many cases, out of hell. Who gonna intercede for them if not you? Oh, thank God, if he sent a prophet, an evangelist, some strange out of the street to ask your unsaved husband, or your unsaved wife, what are you saying? And it just preaches to them right there in Walmart. But otherwise, God put you there for that purpose. But the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were the children unclean, but now are they holy. God has put you there to purify the house. Again, what point was I originally making when I said this? God has called us to be candles. 
And so if the family is dirty, God will put a light in the midst of it. If the school is dirty, God will put you in the midst of it. If the workplace is full of darkness, God says, I'm going to put a candle right there as well. Cause that candle to burn. So don't be always in a hurry to check out of the place because it's full of darkness. You own a mission to be light there. And don't hide the light. Oh, we can do that really well. Because we don't want the ridicule. We don't want the shame. We don't want them to call us holier than thou. You think you're so holy and pure, blah, 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 blah. And in this particular case that I just read, you could be in a relationship where there is darkness and God will call you to be the light. I know you're going to be in a natural sense of what that looks like. You with that man and he trying to jump your bones every day. And you this Christian woman, you got some value, you got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. You're supposed to be the one to look at him and say, we should not be doing this because... You might. I think it's a privilege to be able to say that and to lose somebody over that. Either you will find this out, one or the other. Either they were just with you for that anyway, and they're leaving you because they can't get that. And you also get a chance to see how they feel about God's word. I need to know how you feel about God's word since you want us to date. Since you want me to open myself up to you. And God knows who else you're opening yourself up to. I need to know how you feel about God's word, so I'm going to bring it up to see what you say. I'm going to find out right then, are you really a Christian? I'm going to find out right then, do you love me? If you're with somebody that will love, that love you, they will protect your spirituality. If they are a mature person that really love you, that understand that if I cause you to engage in this, the Holy Spirit might depart from you, and it is my responsibility to be my brother's keeper. I was meditating on that scripture just a few days ago. I read it in prayer. God came to Cain and said, where is your brother? Where is your brother? Cain's response, am I my brother's keeper? God answered the question when he asked you, where is your brother? your brother? Where's your sister? At that point, he had slew him. He killed him. Because Abel was worshiping God and he didn't like that God rejected him. Now, let me give you what that looked like in the natural for us. There are some people who are half-heartedly worshiping God. They show up, they have their offerings, and they see your holy self sincere and loving God for real. And they will despise you for that. And Cain physically slew Abel. But they will seek to, and this is a revelation to us, spiritually kill you. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's the danger. That's why you've got to have some serious resolve. If God says, stay in this thing. Do you hear what I'm saying? 
you have to have some serious resolve if God is telling you to stay in this thing. Because the one that you're supposed to be close with is the same one that's trying to destroy you. Spiritually. Remember, Cain killed him naturally, but by prophetic revelation, as this is somebody that's supposed to be your brother, supposed to be worshiping God on Saturday, but they're not totally sincere, and they're bringing, trying to, trying to kill you. Spiritually. That's a lot of canes that are slowing my ankles. God will come and deal with you when Abel is dead because his blood will cry against you. Remember what God said? He said, he said the voice of your brother's blood cries. I hear the voice of your brother's blood. You understand what I'm saying? All right, let me try to speak this as normal, as lame, as lame as terms as possible. <clears throat> That person that's not serious about God causes that spiritual one to fall. And God says, where is your brother? Which reveals that you are your brother's keeper. In other words, you have a responsibility to help make sure that your brother's staying and that you're not an offense to them. If they die spiritually, God is going to require it at you. This is Matthew 18 and 6. Now watch this. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone be cast, that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he was drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. The world is full of things that can make you fall off. The world is full of things that can make you fall off. But look at what the scripture says. It must needs be that offenses come. It's going to happen. It's in the world. It needs to happen. The world is evil. But here's the key. This is Matthew 18 and 7. Write it down. But woe to that man by whom the offenses come. Are you the one making them fall? Jesus said, you're going to have offenses in the world. It must need be that offenses come. If you offend that little one, it's better that a millstone be put around your neck and you thrown into the sea. Just think about that. Jesus said it's better for that to happen. It's a lot of people that's causing other people to fall every day. It's a lot of quote unquote Christian people. That's my uh, Cain analogy. Remember, Cain was worshiping. I love God. I love God. But he killed his brother. The one who was really worshiping for real. Because he didn't like it. And again, just uh, for prophetic revelation purposes, there are half hearted people killing people that are trying to worship for real. And God is going to require that blood on your hand. In other words, let me give in layman terms, that half-hearted Christian that believe in fornicating and is not convicted by it, that half-hearted Christian that's smoking that joint and is not convicted by it, is coming to that one that's pure and saying, you ought to try this. Or bring it, or oh, let me hook you up with my girl, uh, Samantha. Ooh, 
and they bring Samantha along, and Samantha starts to subtly seduce you into the bed, God is going to require, and the one who initially started that offense, the blood of him if he fall. That's what he said. The voice of your brother's blood cried at me. There's a lot of that going on. Youth in the church, supposed to be in youth ministry. They sold out to God. And you know what they're doing? Tricking other people into sin. They ain't pure. They ain't praying. They don't read their Bibles outside of the church. And they don't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. There is no conviction there. And you're speaking to someone who knows about this. Before I started encountering the Spirit of God, there was no conviction when I sinned. And I was in church every Sunday. When the Holy Spirit walked in the room, I had to stop sinning. It's not right. This can't happen. We can't do this. That's what we did. You know what I'm saying? That's when the Holy Spirit came in. It was no longer an option for me to have a bunch of friends. I needed a wife when the Holy Spirit came. You can't do that when he's there. Yes. No, 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 no. Whatever you got to offer me, it's not worth it. Jesus said, I'm going to tell you something. It's a lot of people making people fall all the time. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, it's better that a millstone be put up in your neck and you cast into the depths of the sea and drown in there. Mm -hmm. If you're the one who offends the little one, you cause somebody else to lose the faith. Don't you know what you're doing? What you're doing to them is worse than killing them in the flesh. Don't you realize that you are subjecting people to eternal, unending damnation? When God sent his son to die for them, you are opposing the work of God. For what? The lust of the flesh. Or the desire to be like the Lord. God goes out of his way. Prepares his son before the world was ever created. I see that they're going to fall. I'm going to send you. You're going to sacrifice. You're going to suffer. Just to have some knucklehead, half hearted Christian that ain't serious, ain't experiencing no conviction, showing up at the building just like Cain was. We're going to worship. I'm going to bring you my fruit of the ground. Yeah, I'm worshiping God. Cause another people to fall. Killing Abel's. Killing, killing them. God says, because I'm going to tell you something. God looks at the big picture. See, the us, oh, <laughs> I just made him smoke a little blunt. <laughs> I just got him starting cigarettes. <laughs> I just made him drink some of that, what they call it, Patron, whatever you want to call it. Oh, <laughs> that's fun, though. Oh, I got her in the bed. Ooh, are you done for? I got her yesterday, man. She put her pants down. You know they're going to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell somebody. <laughs> There's not a young man I know alive that is not married that after they get with a female, they don't go tell their friends. It's just the bottom line. They're going. Somebody gonna know I got that, you know, where I hit that, uh, you know, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no. I did that, yeah, yeah. That's a notch, that's a notch in you, though. When God sees it, when God sees it, you just have subjected somebody to eternal damnation. And if I required their lives that they're hearing right now, you could have done worse than killing them. 
you have destroyed this spirit. The thing that I sent my son to suffer and die to save them from it. That's why he says this. Woe unto the one by whom offense is come. Now, I'm trying to keep this all together the best I can. I have so many scriptures here, but I'm just telling you in language terms what a lot of these scriptures say. Is that okay? Or do you want verses? They must say she did. You don't want me to read the verses? You don't want me to tell you where the verses are? doing great. I'm doing great. All right. Let's go. Oh, okay. I'm just watching the time. Jesus said, It's better for me to stand at a sea if I'm the one that makes you children drink. If I'm the one that makes you smoke. If I'm the one that make you fornicate, if I'm the one that make you commit adultery, if I'm the one that make you hold on to anger and hatred, if I'm the one that make you steal, it's better that I stay at a sea. We're going to take this big rock in a chain and throw you in the water. I'm trying to paint a picture for us. Jesus said that is better. If he says that is better, what awaits the one who offends another? That's better. Now, you know, if somebody come up to us, you was the one guy, that virgin, Samantha in the bed, and you took her virginity, and you excited about it, and some soldiers came and got you, yeah. stood you up at the edge of the sea, and you know it's a hundred feet deep, put a huge stone around your neck and kicked you off up into it. How many of you know sin would slow down immediately in a lot of places? Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? The reality of this scripture is true even though that's not happening to people. Jesus just wanted to make a point that that's better to happen to you. You know why? Because what my father and me will do to you for that, offending that little one, is worse. And it is coming. It's coming. It's coming. So what does the word of God say to us? Very simple verse. What does Jesus say? Matthew 5 and 13, you are the salt of the earth. <clears throat> what is salt? <clears throat> Why does Jesus say you are the salt of the earth? Well, let's let Jesus tell us what he meant by that. Mark 9 and 50, we can write it down. Matthew 15 and 30, Jesus, 13, Matthew 5, excuse me, and 13, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Mark 9 and 50 tells us what he meant when he said salt. If you want, you can go to uh, Mark 9 and 50, I'll read it. Uh, and just write down Mark 5 and 13, but I'm going to read it. Mark 5 and 13 says, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus defined what you meant uh, to me when you said salt. Okay, I'll tell you Mark 9 and 50. Salt is good. How many of you had some chicken without some salt on it? <laughs> All right, now you understand what I mean by that, right? Don't you bring me no, no ribs, don't bring me no meat, don't bring me no roast without some seasoning. I will not eat it because it's not good. Salt. It's a revelation in Mark 9 50. Salt is good. Right. So, what, what did Jesus mean when he said, You are the salt of the earth? You are the what? Good of the earth. You are the good of the earth. 
And if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of man. Now you know what Jesus is saying here? The earth is full of evil and darkness. And you know what I did about this evil and dark earth? I threw some salt in. You are the salt on the nasty ribs. You the salt on that roast that ain't good without you. God has put you there to make this thing good. Your purpose, I just, God is telling me your purpose right now. Your purpose is to be salt. Workplace, job, family. I need to be salt. I need to be good. I need to be the good in my workplace. I need to be the good in my family. I need to be the good in my school. I need to be the good in the youth ministry. You know what I'm saying? That's crazy, ain't it? But if the salt, which is, I put you there to be good, because I know that the rest of this is not good, has lost its savior. You've lost your goodness. You ain't good for nothing but to be trodden under the foot of men. Those are some harsh words for God to say to us. Good for nothing. Good for nothing. Who want God to look at you and say you're good for nothing? You are good for nothing. You are not serving me any purpose. You're good for nothing. Who want God to say that to us? If you stop being the light, that's what he's going to say to you. Because he put you there to be light in a dark place. You're good for nothing. And again, you can't compromise your life. Because Cain will try to kill Abel. He will. The half-hearted worshiper will try to slay the one that's truly worshiped. Jesus, 
One specific that I think of died a year later. Are you ready to be the one when all of them are like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Man, you going to have when you die. And you the only one talking like that? Jesus wanted to deliver you from this. The wages of sin is death with the gift of God. Through Jesus Christ is eternal life, eternal fellowship and walking with God. Let me pray with you. Again, I'm going to tell you the toughest place to do it when you're in that relationship. You remember that first example, first Corinthians 7? Who's going to be the life in the relationship when it's when it's smoking hot at 11 o'clock at night. Who's going to be the light then? Remember that the first example we gave? The, the sinner with the, the same one, right? I put you there to sanctify the thing, right? Now that's in the case of marriage, but some of you in dating relationships, but this can be a plot line. You might be dating a heathen. You might be dating a Cain-like spirit. Yeah, you're in the house, but you ain't worshiping God for real. You are the light of the world, a city set on the hill, which cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle, but neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. But they take the candle and give it light to all that are in the house. God has put you there to give light. Let your light shall shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And again, people don't pull out candles in the midst of places that's full of light. Candles are pulled out in places that, are missed, that have darkness in them. All right, let me shut this thing down. Now, if you have your Bibles, go to Mark 11, and again, this will be it. We get you out of here before 12. In fact, we're 15 minutes early. <laughs> but I want you to see this because this is very true in Mark 11. And what we've been talking about, being a light, what we've been talking about, there are times when God will have you walk next to people in darkness, and you got to maintain your light because God puts you there because He knows you're in darkness and you're trying to save them. It happens in relationships, homes, and jobs. What else we talk about? Be careful of that Cain spirit. That's that half-hearted worship that will try to seduce you into sin. And God is going to require the blood of the Abels on, on that Cain. And remember that scripture we read? This, if you offend the little ones, you don't stone in there, cast you in the sea. If you offend people, woe unto the one by whom offenses come. Don't you be the one offending people. Light. Don't you be the one offending people. Christian. Salt. Raise your hand if you're a Christian in here. Raise your hand if you ain't a Christian. Put your hand down if you ain't a Christian. Hey. You know what it means? Then that means you're going to be a light. When darkness comes at you, you're going to be the light when that came spirit that was just in the house of God saying, Come on. I'm light. Don't hear my scripture no more. Keep me on the task. Now don't go preaching somewhere else. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Mark 11, 12, it says, on, Mark 11, verse 12, it says, On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, Jesus, he, this is Jesus, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of the figs 
was not yet. And Jesus answered and said, No man eat fruit from thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now skip down to verse 20. It says, In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold the fig tree, pay attention to this next word, that you cursed. It withered away. Here's a revelation. That fig tree was created for the purpose of bearing fruit. Even as you and me as Christians are created to be salt and candles, light in dark places. Which means when God put me in a light place, I, a dark place, I know I'm going to be a light. There are times, and it may even as according to this scripture be seemingly an out of season time. It's not going to be always when it's convenient. When the Lord is going to pass by, you're not even going to know it. You're going to run happily to it. Oh, I know my fig tree got fruit. Oh, I know my salt is still salt. I know my candle is lighted and this is that dark place. And he's going to visit you at that workplace. He's going to visit you at that school. He's going to look at what you're doing in that family. And he's going to give you his full attention just like he did this full fig tree. We don't see no fruit on it. If you don't see no fruit on it, the purpose I put you there was to bear fruit. The purpose I put you there was to be a candle. The purpose I put you there was to be a light. The Lord will speak a curse over you. And if he curse you and say, Oh, this fig tree will never bear fruit ever again. Let me tell you something. If God said that to any one of us, there's no more good that we can manifest. God has already determined I'm going to judge you. I'm not going to put my power on you to make you do right. I'm not going to put my power on you to make you bear fruit. This fig tree was, wasn't obedient. I created you to bear fruit. You better bear it. In season and out of season, all the time, bear fruit. Have fruit on you. Keep fruit on you. That's the revelation. So that when Jesus comes, he can be happy and say, the fig tree that I created to bear fruit has fruit on it, even out of season. Keep fruit. Never let your life be without it. Never let your life be without kindness, self-control, temperance, witnessing to people, praying for people in the midst of adversity, still showing kindness, still showing love. Don't let somebody pull you out of the flesh and you fighting all in the street looking like the world. Father God, we come to you now in Jesus' name. Thank you for this word about being lights in the midst of darkness. We thank you for revealing to us the importance of our witness, God. Woe unto the one by whom offenses come. Don't you be the one that's making somebody fall. Oh, Jesus. This is better than a millstone. We put on our neck and we cast into the sea. Take a few minutes to let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Maybe you've been the one that's been offending people. I have been there. I know what it is to be that Christian in church every Sunday and not living it when you get outside those doors. I know what it means to have peer pressure all around you. And you going along with whatever your peers say. 
And God says to you, I put you there to be light. I put you there to be salt. Don't you be the one by whom offenses come. Don't you be the one. Father, we thank you.